much. Don't know how much batter we got in that camera today, but this is our fourth. This is our fourth um, episode of Where Credit Is Due. Today's my 63rd birthday, and it's going to be a nice day. Tina's taking me up to Danville, where she's found a, you know, one of those drive-up and get your food places like Arby's, except that it isn't a chain. It's called Dairy Heart, H-A-R-T. We spent a lot of time running around Danville, but I never saw this place before, but she found it. And uh, in addition to the, you know, road food, they have, it seems, they take great pride in their ability to concoct ice cream creations. So, we're going to make a run up there today, and, and our girl Emily and her boyfriend James are going to be able to join us, uh, which is nice because we like our kids so much, and uh, yeah, so 2022, 63 years old, and 
I've taken a hell of a licking, but I'm still picking. And I played that song, uh, I found it the day before yesterday in a big stack of lyrics. And then I ended up fooling around with it and remember that I remembered I could play it. It's old, it's from, uh, it's from two years after my divorce, which would be 1995, I think. And that song is about getting over it. That song's about getting over a story that you told yourself for way too long that was never true in the first place, which is sort of the story of my life of interactions with other human beings. I'm such a damn sucker for... I'm a sucker for getting snagged into what ultimately kind of hurts once you're standing in it. But uh, today I wanted to talk about um, an old friend of mine named Pete Zolly. Um, Pete is uh, one of the first people that ever listened to my songs and and saw merit in them way back around 1991 um, when I was living in Massachusetts after having gotten out of the Navy um, my first wife and I were living up in Fitchburg Massachusetts which is not too far from the New Hampshire border I end up living near borders a lot and uh, You know, I'd been horsing around with the musicians I met in the city of Fitchburg. Um, I remember one guy named John Davis that worked in the big music store there, and we got together a number of times and, um, you know, tried to come up with some working arrangements of the songs I'd been writing for, well, at that point, for about 15 years. And then that didn't get, that never got any shoes. And at the time, I was also doing a heck of a lot of jamming with kids at, well, I shouldn't call them kids, students at uh, Fitchburg State College. Um, I was doing graduate work there in clinical special education, and just by association with the campus, I learned about the school newspaper, and I met some of the people there. I think they wrote a thing about me one time after I played in their pub or Rathskeller or whatever it's called. And then I started meeting some musicians that were college kids, and uh, some of them were really good players, and all of them were really fun to hang around. And they they were this was back in the days when you know bands like Fish and the Spin Doctors and stuff, kind of like a you know an after effect of the Grateful Dead. A lot of these bands were popping up, jam bands culture was coming back and these guys were knee deep in it and stuff and so you know so music was happening in the way that that region allowed it to happen for me and I heard about an open stage open mic thing that was happening at the WAG the Worcester Artists Group and for people who've been touring original music around the country for a long long time if you were doing it in this 80s or in the 90s and came through New England you probably tried to get to the WAG because it was the most open-minded and open-eared place to play music that personally I've ever encountered it was lovely incredibly wonderful people living there because it was sort of a residential art and performance space you know the the <coughs> incredible t-shirt artist uh, Joey Mars was living there. Uh, Mark Polini, an artist that over the years I've seen work in a bunch of different media who now lives in Georgia was in there and some other folks. Well, anyways, I just, you know, I'd seen in the paper that there was this open stage and I went down, took a guitar and, um, you know, signed up for my three songs on this list and did them. 
Jesus. The first time I was there, I heard some really blistering, incredible acoustic guitar coming out of this corridor in the back. The, the WAG was a big renovated, semi-renovated warehouse. And I walked back into the back of this place where this, no, this guitar sound was coming from, and it was the guitarist Dan Stearns. Some of you know about Dan Stearns. He's incredible. Microtonal. He's got the most... It's, it's just though his hands have no bones in them. I don't, I don't know how to... I, I guess it's the opposite of arthritis. He's the most dexterous guitarist I've ever met in my life. There's like no obstacles in either of his hands. Nothing physical or psychological or anything else in there that would keep him from doing exactly what this thinks instantaneously. Very amazing player. And I listened to him. And he got done. I guess he was rehearsing for his set. And I said, I really like that. That sounded great. And um, I said, would you come up and put some licks on my songs? And he said, sure, what are the songs? And so we ran them in the corridor there. And and so I think the first time I went to the WAG, I, I jammed with Dan Stearns. And there was a guy there that day who also played a couple songs he wrote. And his name was Pete Zolly. Initially, I thought Pete Zolly was a guitarist because that's the first thing I heard him play. Um, and I liked his songs. He had one about the city of Providence that I liked, and I think he covered uh, an Elvis Costello tune that day, which was rather uncommon. And um, he and I got talking after each of us had played our sets, and um, by the next time, I think it was that they had the open stage at the WAG, Peter and I were... Um, helping each other out on each other's songs. And we did that for a couple of weeks, I suppose a couple of weeks. And we decided it might be fun to try to find a bass player and a, and a drummer and, uh, you know, see how much we could make this thing congeal into a band. And as, uh, as, as, as uh, good fortune would have it, these two brothers we met, Keith and Jeff Prescott. Keith was a drummer, and Jeff was a bass player, and Jeff had a nice voice, too, and he could sing tenor, even. And uh, so the four of us began to convene in the basement of this three-decker that I lived in up in Fitchburg, and I shit you not, the ceiling was about exactly as tall as I am, and, and a lot of forehead cuts and bruises in that basement. <laughs> but, um... The four of us, probably for about a year, I suppose, from beginning to end, were a band called Progress, and we sang my songs and Pete's songs, mostly, and a couple of covers, a couple of covers. But Progress fell apart, acrimoniously, as many bands I've been in have. It's always a battle of the... Uh, no, my idea is better than your idea coming from me or somebody else in the group. That, or maybe it's just the things that are never spoken that ultimately sort of like ice will break up a sidewalk, the things, you know, in the winter as it expands and freezes. I think that the things that people don't talk about very often are like that ice, and they get into the things people don't talk about can really mess up your foundation. But anyways, progress came apart, and uh, in the couple of years after that, I think that was 1991, Peter and Keith and Jeff went off and formed a band called The Larks, and, um, and I kept banging around open mics and, uh, you know, just pick up jams with people and stuff like that. But I, my marriage was falling apart. It was really on a pretty steep downward trajectory. And um, a lot of music was coming out of me. I think some of you know how that is. When life um, covers you with cheese, you find yourself uh, with a lot of song ingredients. So I had a lot of songs coming out of me, and they were pretty serious, like that last one. That song, by the way, is called I Goo, A-I space G-U, exclamation point, which in Korean means wow or 
holy shit, or oh my god, Korean person, when you hear, hear them holler, I go, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's surprise and alarm and maybe even astonishment or awe. It's, a, it's an all-purpose expression for such things. And, um, and, and my divorce was certainly an Igu moment. And uh, that song talks about me getting through it, kind of remembering. It's hard after a relationship crumbles to the ground to stop thinking about the good times that existed in that. And that song's about a trip I made down to Laurel, Maryland to get over it. And uh, did get over it. But anyways, um, I did that song today because that song appeared on a record that's called Duck or Mask from, I think, 1998 that uh, Peter Zolly produced. And, and it basically played the greater quantity of the instruments on uh, the arrangements that he came up with for my songs. He wanted me to send him acoustic guitar and voice. In other words, as little of me as possible. Um, because Peter and I had already worked together in a, for, for a few years and, and were really quite polarizingly different in the studio. Let's just put it that way. Um, I was always willing to throw more ideas and sounds and stuff into productions and Peter always felt it was a good idea if we trim off the fat and bone. Um, and uh, he, he has a different notion of excesses than I do, and it's a lot... Well, he can be pretty excessive in his productions, but it doesn't sound weird. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Unless he wants it to. Um, but um, Peter produced this record, Ducker Mask, which became the working title of the record, I guess, because my source tapes are rather legendarily iffy sometimes that I send out. And um, plus at that time I was playing in this bizarre tuning which was two high B strings. I didn't have a high E, I had two B strings in the one and two position on the guitar because I was able to create with that and they weren't the same gauge strings. That's important because I was able to take standard fingerings of chords and get a much more beautiful sound out of it somehow, I thought. And um, so the E, A, D, G, B, B tuning, where the two B strings would almost chorus one another. No matter how close in tune I got them, they never quite were. And it was beautiful. It, 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 it added a almost like a mandolin or 12 string shimmer um, to some of my chord voicings. And I used that tuning on a couple of CDs back then. I think the first Kudzu CD was in that tuning. And I don't know. I don't do it anymore. But uh, I think the first conversation that my wife Tina had with somebody about me before we'd met was her asking a friend of mine, is his guitar supposed to sound like that? <laughs> when I was playing in a club with a band and he said yeah that he does that on purpose and somehow or another that kind of gave us something to talk about the first time when we were talking the first time but uh, Pete Zolli he um, when I met him he was playing an acoustic guitar first band we were in he was playing electric guitar went in progress and then a I think it was probably about two years later, I was playing at this open mic at a place called P.T. Beanie's in Worcester, and I looked out, and my God, there were Pete and Keith sitting there listening to me play. And I got off the stage, and this is when I was running my Fender Montara through a, through a pedals array. It was a, it was a pretty big guitar sound for an acoustic. And after I played those songs, I think I played uh, Monster Inside, Build a Bridge, It was that era, and maybe where you are. Um, we decided we'd try it again and try to form a trio, a different band. 
and that band became Hip Bone, guitar and voice, Keith played drums and percussion, Peter played bass and sang harmony, and occasional, I think on uh, Tales of Brave Ulysses, he sang lead, and that's a cream cover, and he sang lead on a couple of things. And Hip Bone did what it did. You know, you can go to my Bandcamp page and see the five or six or seven releases that we put out. Our first four releases were cassette releases, 60 minute or 45 minute cassettes with six to ten songs on them. In fact, Ducker Mask, the CD that the song I Goo came off of was initially a cassette release back when cassettes were cool. I guess they're getting cool again. King Solomon was right. <laughs> but anyways, uh, Hipbone, Hipbone kind of almost became a big thing in Massachusetts. We, 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 we got all kinds of newspaper press, journalistic support, Scott McLennan, Charlene Arsenal, Brian Goslow, and other people that were writing in the central Massachusetts papers were they were being so wonderful. They, they liked us, you know, and they were pushing it. And, uh, but we didn't become the next big thing. We, we sure played around at lots and lots of places and tried to extend our reach. But just like most bands, it, it bone eventually fell apart. And I must say that the amount of drinking I was doing at that point in my life was probably a fairly large part of the um, accountability pie for that band and others falling apart. Um, although it's an incredible canon of work that we recorded. And that brings me back to Pete Zolli because Pete Zolli produced all of the Hip Bone releases. And a lot of them were pretty much just live recordings with the addition of harmony, vocals, and perhaps um, a guitar solo, but we were doing this stuff on a cassette four track back then. And um, he's a really good recordist. He's really good with mic placement and stuff like that. And, and I'm really proud of the Hip Bone Canon that we put out. We, we recorded probably 50 songs, uh, you know, including outtakes and stuff. And we, we got a lot of stuff live. Um, archive too because every show was different there was an element of improvisation in what we did and um, you never knew what you were going to get um, and uh, Pete has a great ear um, and he's able to rally people together to make a song sound as good or better than it is and um, I'm really grateful to have met Pete we're both Leos. Um, we're both pretty damn bullheaded about stuff. But we also both appreciate each other. And uh, in, in as much as we can. And, um, and uh, so I guess I'm making this video to, to shout out to Pete Zolli. Because he's committed an enormous amount of time in his life. Um, turning my songs into something really interesting and, 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 and producing these beautiful arrangements and productions of the songs that I could never have really done by myself. I'm too impressionistic, really, to pin myself down with concerns about what other people think. I, it, it's kind of a blessing that I've never made much money doing music because I don't expect it and I haven't become addicted to the acquisition of it, which would compromise, I think, something in what I do, having a commercial motive. Peter plays drums, bass, keyboards, cello, Pedal steel, every manner of 
guitar, six and twelve, electric acoustic. I'm leaving plenty out. There's not too many non wind instruments. I don't think that's it. Pete doesn't play horns or, or reeds. He plays about everything else. He's good. I've watched him go through a whole lot of life changes over the years. He's raised up some neat kids. He's uh, His second marriage worked out better than his first one, just like me. Um, he's a very dogged artist in his own right and, and songwriter um, with, with, with a pro prolific uh, body of work himself. And uh, he's one of the people that stuck with this extremely difficult and unpredictable musician through a lot of thick and thin um, over the years. And um, the record Ducker Mask, Pete said, I'm trying to make a record of your songs, Brett, that girls can like. <laughs> and he succeeded. <laughs> Um, beautiful record, Ducker Mask. Um, if, you, if you're listening to a hip bone song, Pete was the guy who recorded it for us, pulled us together for that. If you're listening to the first Kudzu CD, first Kudzu record, which was called Redneck Gothic, Peter's stamp is all over that. Pete's amazing at tucking some kind of melody that you know in one of his arrangements like just yesterday i was listening to this record ducker mask kind of to get my head together for this video and damn if i didn't hear another 60s pop quote tucked into one of those arrangements um i remember one song that was on the kudzu record uh called hello how are you right and Peter thought about all these songs that have the word hello in them from down the ages, you know, and found a way in the choruses to kind of tuck a little hint about that in there, like hello, Mary Lou, and hello, it's me, and uh, hello, goodbye. Um, he's witty. He's, he's real clever. Um, he's, you know, some people would say OCD. I just think he's got um, an excellence of stand, a standard of excellence that he sets for himself and kind of always has where, you know, no bad sounds will be permitted. None shall pass. And, um, it's cool. You, 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 I would invite you to go listen to that record. You know, the reason why I put these links in, I, Bandcamp always lets people listen a couple times for free, which is about as many times as anybody listens to anything these days. Let's face it. Friends buy your records. Everybody else listens to them if they feel like it, right? A lot of my stuff is up on archive.org. I kind of like that it has the umbrella of the Library of Congress kind of near it um, as far as it surviving me, you know, my art. So a lot of this stuff can be searched up on archive.org, and it's totally free there. You can download the whole damn record and stuff. Like I said, I've never been had much of a profit motive I mean if I'm playing with other musicians I want to pay them um, if we're putting out a record I want to break even um, and if I'm sending things out for review postage and shipping and stuff I want to break even but I wouldn't call that a profit motive I would just say that you know feeding my family and paying the mortgage comes first and every anything else is gravy and if we can break even that's good and the story of my life has been you almost broke even most of the time you almost broke even um, but if you're in it for compensation it's not real likely that that's going to be a fountain you can go back to to drink from a lot I admire people that can do that you know, tour, 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 tour. I can't. I can't drive very far anymore because it just throws my whole neck and shoulders out of whack for a day or two just to just to drive to Winston and back. And um, steering wheels, for some reason, will make this middle finger sometimes 
I'll wake up after I've done some driving and that sucker will be locked down there just like that and I have to physically pop it up again and um, yeah, touring is out of the question I'm gonna go to the grave probably not traveling much further than an hour and a half from where we live um, for any reason uh, involving music it just hurts too much anymore to go out and do that and uh, these days it, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit done with Eden North Carolina as a place where art can happen or music can happen because this town of 13,000 is run by about 400 friends of each other and if they can't control it they ain't gonna let it happen and uh, we're struggling with a profoundly racist uh, leadership in this town and that just clamps down art even further so uh, I've spent a what, good part of the last 20 years uh, trying to be an arts advocate uh, and, and uh, a music promoter uh, in this town and they're not having it you know for all the churches we have there there's not much more than maybe two or three molecules of forgiveness within 10 miles of Eden North Carolina people that run it they don't forgive they don't sober up they don't give a damn about anybody else they'll lie your ass right into the dirt uh, you'll, you'll find that a hundred people know more about you than you do and they got it all through someone that hates your ass but has a lot of money and keeps throwing their money at people and people get addicted to getting that money and so they tolerate their bullshit and lies and sins and stuff in the pursuit of a bottom line and that's the way Eden's run for as long as I've been here people in leadership here really don't have friends they have alcoholic associates with a lot of spending money and they, they they'll they'll grind on that relationship until they all learn to dislike each other or get bored with each other and then they'll run off and find some more people that they can be drunk with six seven nights a week and uh, mess people up it's a mean damn town I wouldn't invite you to live here there's a lot of nice people living in other parts of the uh, county but uh, hell even Reedsville and Mayadan say we don't go to Eden Eden's evil and uh, you know I've been standing up for and bragging on Eden for a long time believing that it could improve but I don't think so not in my lifetime you know when we moved here 23 years ago 24 years ago some old guy I met said God took his hand off of this town a long time ago. You're not going to find very many good people here. And I thought he was just being kind of folksy. Right? But sometimes people tell you the truth the first time you meet them, and it's a good idea to believe it. So, uh, like that song, I Goo subtitled I think we used to be fine uh, I used to think Eden North Carolina was fine the land of two rivers and uh, it's not so I guess I can't give credit where credit is due in a good way regarding this location but a lot of the music that I wrote in this location wouldn't have happened if it wasn't such a damn horrible place to live and uh, as we all know, people that write songs, uh, tragedy and upset are some of the greatest fertilizers of song. So this has been a double-edged sword. I reckon I'll still be here on this property when I die. Yeah. Dad thinks I'm going to live another 30 years. He says we got good genes. I told him I don't think so, Dad. I think you're, I think you're going to be one of the ones that's long in the tooth, but. I think I've had too many head injuries over the years, you know, sports, foolishness, etc. And uh, if I could get another good 20 years, that would be great. Although I don't really relish the thought of being 83 years old, not even a little bit. But 
being 63 today feels pretty good. It's a good day to think about old friends. I wonder if Peter will be pissed off that I talked about him. I hope not. Um, Pete Zolly. Multi-instrumental. He really likes... He, he, he really likes music that goes in places that he can't predict, I think. Um, and, and I'm kind of tickled that for a good while there... Um, Pete put his heart and soul into making songs I wrote sound good. And I really appreciate that a lot. So thanks, Pete. And uh, I don't know. I guess I don't have much more to, else to say today except uh, let's get along a little better, Americans, please. You know, in competition, when one team wins, the other team loses. And I'd like to think we're all on the same team here. I do believe we're on the same team. And that's why I want God to bless America, because it don't feel like he's doing it very much right now. Possibly because we don't deserve it. So happy trails, and uh, thanks again, Peter, and uh, thanks for listening, and uh, if you know Pete, and you haven't spoken with him in a long time, drop him a line. I think he prefers texting, um, but let's talk to each other while we're still on this side of the grass, people, and... Uh, And I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the week. Thanks for listening.